is that this bill be now read a second time, and I call the honourable member for Morton. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak on the Australian Citizenship Legislation Amendment strengthening the requirements for Australian citizenship and other measures, Bill 2017. I'd like to start by acknowledging the fine words of the member for Corwell, Maria Van Vakenau, who has a much greater understanding of citizenship than I will ever have, and thank her for her great words. There are many ways to become an Australian, Deputy Speaker. Some of us were born here. We can thank our parents and grandparents for that. Some Indigenous Australians have around 3,250 generations before them, proud members of the oldest civilisation on earth. Some of us were born elsewhere but to parents who were Australian, and some came to Australia later as children or adults choosing to make Australia home. Being born here doesn't necessarily make you a better Australian than someone who has chosen to make their home here. In fact, the opposite is often true. Those Australians who have made a conscious decision to make Australia their home and pledge allegiance to this nation often value their citizenship more than someone who has received it at birth. Citizenship is important. It has important implications for those who hold it and also, sadly, for those who don't. The preamble to the Australian Citizenship Act 2007 says, and I quote, Australian citizenship represents full and formal membership of the community of the Commonwealth of Australia. And Australian citizenship is a common bond involving reciprocal rights and obligations, uniting all Australians while respecting their diversity." End quote. As an Australian citizen, you do not require a visa to live in Australia. You have the right and, in fact, the obligation to vote in elections, uh, not in postal surveys, but in elections. You can access government support programs that aren't available to non-citizens. As Australian citizens, we take for granted these rights and responsibilities, but for those who do, do not have citizenship, they can be a, a priceless and, uh, and something that is cruelly out of reach. Like you, Deputy Speaker, I attend many citizenship ceremonies. Uh, in Morton, they're, they're held regularly, and I'm always overwhelmed by the excitement and pride displayed by our brand new citizens, these proud new Aussies. In fact, it's one, I would say it's the best part of this job to be involved in these citizenship ceremonies. These ceremonies are a chance to celebrate the importance of Australian citizenship, a chance to welcome new Aussies and for the rest of us, those attending, to reflect on what it actually means to be Australian. I have had many, many occasions to reflect on what being Australian means to me and these things I hold dear. The respect for the rule of law, respect for parliamentary democracy and par a parliament that does its job. Australian values such as mateship and a fair go for all and offering a helping hand. Having a unique Australian identity which transcends skin colour and religion, making us the most successful multicultural nation in the world. But this piece of legislation brought in by the Turnbull government makes sweeping changing changes to the eligibility, eligibility requirements for people seeking Australian citizenship. But more than that, this bill proposes changes to the definition of what it is to be Australian and of what sort of country we will become. The changes of most concern to me are the new English language test, and I say that as someone who taught English for 11 years and who has a, a, an honours degree in literature. And the other change of concern to me is increasing the time required for permanent residents to live in Australia before they can become citizens. The announcement by Prime Minister Turnbull of these proposed changes has caused immense stress to many residents of Morton. Morton is a vibrant, culturally diverse community. 46 per cent of the people who live in Morton were not born in Australia. Compare that to the percentage of people out of the whole Australian po population born overseas, and that's 28 per cent. Morton has a large Chinese community, many Taiwanese, Indians, former Yugoslavs, Pacific Islanders, Somalians, Eritreans, Ethiopians, Sudanese, Rwandans, Filipinos, South Africans, uh, obviously ind Indigenous Australians, New Zealanders, Fijians, Koreans and Vietnamese, to name just a few. The whole Morton community is much more richer, so much more vibrant and so much more creative and economically strong due to the contribution of these ethnic communities. My fellow Mortonites are worried that they or their relatives will not be welcome to become Australian citizens. They will become people who live amongst us but won't be of us. As I have said, the two changes particularly disturbing me 
are the addition of the university level English language test and the additional time before an application for citizenship can be made to the department. Before becoming eligible to be an Australian citizen, you currently need to pass a citizenship test. And guess what? No surprises, but the test is written in English. So to pass the test, you first need to be able to understand the English language well enough to read the test. This bill, this pernicious bill, proposes to add a separate English language test which will assess the standard of English to the person applying for citizenship. But obviously you won't have to undertake this test if you're from New Zealand, from the United Kingdom, from Canada, from the United States or from Ireland. But to pass this new test, it will be necessary to have a standard of English equivalent to that expected of university entrance. It is not a conversational level English test. It is a comprehensive test that requires skills in speaking, listening, comprehension and writing. You need to, the, the applicant will need to be able to write an essay to complete this test successfully. The standard required is referred to as IELTS Level 6. That is the standard required by some universities for entrance to their courses. That would be a much higher standard than any country in Europe, including Britain. This will make it much harder for people from non-English speaking countries to become Australian citizens. It would be almost impossible for most adult migrants from non-English speaking countries to become proficient in English to that standard after completing the 510 hours of English language tuition provided by the government. That's 13 weeks of full-time study, effectively, Deputy Speaker. There would be many Australians who have lived their whole life in Australia who would not have that standard of English competency. In fact, teachers of language say that you would need something more like, if you're an adult, more like 18 months of tuition, that closer to 2,700 hours to reach that standard. There is a real risk that requiring a standard unachievable for many migrants, uh, because they'll be working rather than sitting in a classroom learning a language, it will actually then create a permanent underclass of residents who will never be able to gain citizenship. Never. They will live here, some will work here, but they won't be us. This could be a recipe for disaster, Deputy Speaker. It well might unpick the fabric of our beautiful multicultural society. Now, the other measure proposed by this Turnbull government bill is to increase the waiting time before being eligible to apply for citizenship. I point out, Deputy Speaker, that this, even though we're debating this legislation now, we haven't had a vote, this measure has already been implemented before this debate is finalised. It, how do I know this? Because the department is not currently processing applications. This is an arrogant minister, Minister Dutton, who has made a decision before the parliament has actually voted on the legislation that would implement this policy. There is already a four-year waiting time before someone can apply for citizenship. I stress that again. Four-year waiting time. So what the Turnbull government wants is for migrants to have to wait for four years after they have been granted permanent residency before they can apply for citizenship. And this will greatly extend the time they need to live in Australia without being able to pledge allegiance to the nation that they uh, want to call home or do call home. So some people initially come here as temporary workers or even students, and, and uh, they may have more than a one four-year visa back-to-back, -back, then some long-term temporary visas before they eventually become a permanent resident, get PR status. These people could be living in Australia for 10, 12, 13 years before they are invited to take uh, uh, an oath of allegiance to Australia. The government has already said they can live here as a permanent resident, so why would the government stand in the way of asking them to pledge their allegiance to Australia? It makes absolutely no sense. And I think the member for Corwell might have touched on the motivation behind this, and that is, and I, I support the member for Corwell, there is an element of racism in this motivating this legislation. Now, is it about national security? Let's have a look. The Turnbull government has definitely tried to wrap these changes up in the cloak of national security. Uh, there's been many tranches of legislation that have made changes to national security. This is not one of them. This is not one of them. Labor has supported all of those changes and, in fact, made the, made the amendments much better because of our input. But let me be clear, Deputy Speaker. National security agencies have not recommended these citizenship changes. 
The recommendations actually came from two New South Wales members of the Liberal Party, one current serving senator and a former lower house MP. Nothing to do with our National Security Agency. The four-year waiting time only affects people who have already been granted permanent residency. So there are people who have already been cleared to live here permanently. If these people are a national security threat, why are they walking amongst us? It does not make sense. Uh, Deputy Speaker, last week I held a forum in my electorate uh, so that my community could have their say about these proposed changes by the Turnbull government. The forum confirmed that the Morton community is very concerned and fearful. I heard from many Mortonites that they are concerned about the new language test in particular. They are concerned that the level of English required will be too difficult for them or their family members to ever, ever, ever achieve Australian citizenship. I also heard, uh, and I hadn't considered this, that women will be particularly disadvantaged by the English test, the English language test. Many people come from countries where, where women are not as well educated as men, and these women would not be would be particularly disadvantaged by having to pass a language test of a standard required for university entrance. While many migrant men will quickly enter the workforce in Australia and have daily contact with other English-speaking workers, often their wives or partners may not have these opportunities. So it is much more difficult to become proficient in a language if you are not constantly exposed to conversational dialogue. I was told that older family members would also be unlikely to pass a university standard English test. I was also told that other uh, family members with learning difficulties, for, for example dyslexia, will be disadvantaged by this much more difficult university level English test. Not only are these changes to citizenship eligibility fundamentally unfair and unwarranted, they will change the character of this great modern country. Now, I'm not suggesting it's going to be a drastic change like you know, we've uh, seen from The Handmaid's Tale or V for Vendetta in the UK or George Orwell's 1984, uh, but it will fundamentally change who we are as a nation. Uh, now, we're, what, what are we? We're, we have a strong, long Indigenous history, then British institutions introduced, and on that we have built a great multicultural society. This legislation will fundamentally change that. This nation was built on migration. Before the White Australia policy was introduced, 29 per cent of our population was born overseas. This percentage fell after the implementation of the White Australia policy, uh, the first bit of legislation passed by this parliament. In fact, it went down to 10 per cent in 1945 or so. Then, following the war, we had that uh, populate or perish policy and we had strong immigration growth, where seven million people arrived after the, the war. Currently, 28 per cent of our population was born overseas. We are a multicultural country that's successful, the most successful on earth, I would suggest. Language barriers have never stopped migrants being successful in Australia. There are many stories of people running successful businesses, raising children and grandchildren, but not being able to speak more than a few uh, basic words of English. Uh, at the forum, uh, I had a, on a panel Lewis Lee, who is a Chinese Malaysian who came to Australia to study Greek. Okay? Uh, and, and also Galila Abdel Salam, uh, who 25 years ago formed the Islamic Women's Association of, of Queensland. I could give you story after story, but I'm going to tell you about one guy, a guy called Peter Carrozza, or Pietro Carrozza, the father of a good friend of mine, John Carrozza. Uh, he came to Australia in 1952. He was a, he was a boxer. Uh, he came from a little village called St Marco Evangelista, 15 minutes outside Naples. When he arrived, they sent him out to western New South Wales, out near Dubbo where he said he was, uh, the, the dogs on the property were treated better than him, but he worked hard for two years and then moved to Sydney and then to Brisbane. Uh, we went, went to Brisbane and met his future wife, Beryl, at the Cloudland Ballroom. In 1960, because he was homesick for Italy, he returned home, uh, then decided to come back to Australia. He lived in Coopers Plains, built a house there, then Maruca, and then um, uh, Sunnybank, where Beryl Crosser lives now. Uh, Peter has since died, and I was the pallbearer at his funeral. Um, Peter raised three children, uh, all, all three of them school teachers, John, Paul and Maria. Uh, Maria is the, principal, uh, the deputy principal at Runcorn Heights State School. Paul Cross, as many would know, is a, a great wallaby. And John, John Cross is a very good friend of mine. Uh, we've been in a, in, in a band together. He's a great musician, a great artist, a great filmmaker and a great teacher. And I remember this speech for a guy that could not speak English, and I've heard of some great speeches in my time from Kevin Rudd, from Julia Gillard, from Ken Henry at the Press Club, Obama. But Peter Carrozza's speech is one I remember perfect, word perfectly. At John's 21st, he said, and I quote, John, 
This is in very poor Italian English. John, there are times when I wanted to physically hurt you, but you're my son and I love you. And I think if, if we're going to exclude people like Peter Carrozza from this place, that is a bad, bad thing for this government to do. And I'd ask the Prime Minister to reconsider this legislation. I thank the Honourable Member for Morton.